Hello, good morning. Um, my name is Carol Damien, and I am the curator of this Kislak Center at the Freedom Tower. I'd like to recognize my co-curator, Arthur Dunkelman, who is in the front row. He was also responsible um, for putting this exhibit together, and now he is at the University of Miami at the Kislak Center there, and I am here. So we have this great collaboration between the University of Miami and the Freedom Tower with these fabulous objects and this really amazing collection. So I'm an art historian, and I, my work is in Latin America. So a lot of work in pre-Columbian art, so it was sort of a natural thing for me to get involved with this collection. And actually, I've been involved with this collection for more years, probably, than we want to recognize. Um, but it is one of the treasures of Miami. So what I want to do today is I'm so happy to see all the students here, and I knew that this was going to be a class. So this is going to be a very academic discussion. Um, there's a lot of text that's going to be on the slides. I'm doing this for really for a student audience and for those of you who wouldn't be here if you didn't want to learn about this material. So um, that's why I'll take my time with each slide so that you can see what is in the slide. And also we can talk afterwards. I'm going to keep on schedule because I know the students have their class is over at 940, right? And then another class is coming in. So if you want to hear it again, you can stay. <laughs> because I'm going to do it again at 10 o'clock for the next class. But we're really happy, all of us who work at universities know that it's so important for the students to uh, be here and for us to share this kind of knowledge with students of all ages. You're the future, and we want you to appreciate what is here. And this is your history as well. So, ancient discoveries, modern minds, exploring the legacy of pre-Hispanic objects in an old world. The objects were not in a new world. The objects were in a very old world. So we have to, first of all, get this idea that we're dealing with a new world out of the way. We're dealing with a very old world. We're dealing with a very sophisticated world, a cosmopolitan world, where the artifacts, many of which are there in front of you, and I hope that I'm going to pique your interest with this very small selection that I've chosen. Um, and that you're going to go back in and look at them closely and then come back because it's very didactic. There's a tremendous amount of text involved with each one of the labels. You just can't walk through it. You really have to stop. So those of you who are interested in maps can stop at the maps. Those that are interested in pre-Columbian can do that. Um, so there are many things to, to see in the exhibit. So I'm going to pick certain artifacts to tell this story. So this is the J.I. Kislak collection, and the Kislak collection is present in four major locations. The majority of the work in his collection went to the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., where they actually built an entire gallery for this collection. Incredibly beautiful. When you go to Washington, D.C., go and see the Kislak collection there. And the research um, area in the Library of Congress is, is tremendous as well. Um, he went to the University of Pennsylvania, so many of the, where they have a very fine archeolo archeological and anthropological -like collection, so many of the objects are there. The University of Miami and the Freedom Tower at Miami-Dade College w were split. It was a dual gift. The majority of the works are at the University of Miami, where Arthur is the curator, and just as there was built a permanent gallery here, this is permanent, this isn't going away, the same thing happened at the University of Miami in special collections, much larger and um, absolutely beautiful. So you have to see that one too, they complement each other greatly. Um, but the exhibits are devoted to the history and the culture of the early Americas. This landmark gift includes manuscripts, rare books, maps, artifacts, more than 6,000 objects, 
went to the four institutions with 2,300 of them coming to UM and to Miami-Dade. The majority of them are at UM because they are the, that is the repository of the documents and the maps because of the conservation that is necessary to preserve these fabulous things. Um, it's very difficult without the, the team that's behind the University of Miami Special Collections where they can really work on the preservation and the protection of the objects in a, in a very professional way. So many of the works, and if you go through and you see the, the maps and the documents, you'll see what belongs to the University of Miami. And um, then again, associated with the University of Miami is the Low Art Museum. So objects went to the Low Art Museum and we have borrowed many of the Low Art Museum objects in the collection as well. Somebody asked me, why is the Low Art Museum here? Well, because that's where the artifacts are and we were able to fill in, because of this collaboration, we were able to fill in um, things that we wanted, especially with the ball game. They have a fabulous ball game collection. So um, J.I. Kislak was a real estate entrepreneur and mortgage banker. He, his foundation and his offices are located in Miami Lakes, and he passed away last year, last year, 2018, at 90, 96 years of age. So fortunately, he did live to see his legacy in Miami. Um, at both the University of Miami and here at the Freedom Tower. So the works encompass 500 years with Florida a focal point of his collection. Um, the idea of global exchange and exploration. He wanted his collections to reveal the important role of Miami in this story. The collection also expands in other directions. Here we're just dealing with the Americas at the Kislak uh, Gallery at the University of Miami. They expanded into one of his latest areas of interest, which was polar exploration. So they have a polar um, area there that uh, talks about the Arctic and the Antarctic. And we are going to be changing over some of these cases to remove the very rare objects um, from the light in the next year, and we will do a polar case in here as well, which means, of course, I'm going to have to change a lot of the, the text where I talk about the Americas, because we're going into another continent when, when we do that. So this is meant to be educational, which is why the, the text is very heavy throughout the, uh, throughout the exhibit. But even if you don't read the text, I think you're going to see that you're looking at very precious materials, very rare, very precious materials. So what this does, I'm gonna step back here. You don't have to see me. It's more important to see that. I have to see that too. <laughs> um, it's the story of the earlier explorers who came with dreams of gold and glory, charged with claiming a territory for Spain and souls for the Catholic Church. We have Western concepts of geography, some of the earliest maps, the rarest maps are in this collection. The majority of them are on the large case to the right as you walk in. Um, in the 15th to the 16th centuries, there was this surge of activity where Columbus, Cabral, Diaz, Balboa, Ponce de Leon, Magellan all explored this globe and changed the globe. We have the maps, we have travel reports, we have the exotic stories that appeared in this period. We've got evidence of the Spanish treasure fleets with the cargo of treasures that came from the Americas. We have a whole area that's about the buccaneers and that trade. So we're dealing with major imperial powers in this exhibit, Spain, France, Holland, Portugal, and England. The slave trade was very important through the Middle Passage. 12 million Africans were forcibly carried away to be sold. Native, Americas were su Native Americans were subjected to profound changes and devastating diseases. So the story of the early Americas is a complicated one and a dense one. You can't cover it in a short period of time, that's for sure. Okay, so the 
artifacts that you're looking at, um, and what I have on the screen is a conquest of Mexico, these extraordinary paintings, uh, a facsimile of which is on the back wall, the originals are at the Library of Congress, that talk about um, uh, the conquest of Mexico in a very detailed way, and there are interactive screens so that you can point out each area and you can see where Cortez was and where all the different battles took place. So long before the discovery of America, the areas we know as the Caribbean, Mesoamerica, North America, and South America were thriving centers of culture. There were advanced civilizations, cities, pyramids, and other extraordinary monuments. Science, astronomy, building, writing, metallurgy, pottery were all part of these extraordinary areas. Um, they were old, they were not new, hundreds and hundreds of years old. So what we have in this selection is a little bit of everything to demonstrate the skill sets. So today, because it's really impossible in 40 minutes to cover this exhibit, I decided that I am going to concentrate on only a part of it. But in the exhibit, you will see artifacts that are representative of the Taino, the Nahua, that's Mexico, Maya, Wari in the Andes, Inca, and of course the Aztec. All of these civilizations were destroyed. The contact period ended almost all of their world and only ruins remained and the artifacts hidden within. What is left in this exhibit tells part of their story and that's what we wanted to do when we put up this exhibit, Arthur and I, we wanted to tell a story. We didn't want to just put out a bunch of stuff that didn't seem to relate to each other. And this is what curators do. Curators tell the story. They use the objects to tell a story. So we're gonna deep dive into the exhibit. This is a series at Miami-Dade called Deep Dive. And the programs are aimed to deep dive, to go carefully and closely into a variety of subjects. I will be doing that here, not only me, but with others who will look at the collection. And then there are other lectures that are scheduled that look closely at what this world is all about in a very serious way. So for me, um, as I said, in a very short period of time, I've decided that I'm really gonna concentrate on the artifacts um, because, it's, because that's what I like. I like the artifacts a lot. <laughs> and um, I think they can tell a story and also visually they're so beautiful and so interesting. So I've chosen a very small selection of themes, places, and people to talk about. The Arawaks and the Tainos, which is where we're gonna begin, and talk about science and astronomy, the Maya, great scientists, writing, glyphs, and symbols, and the people and the priests. These are ritual objects. They're all ritual objects. They're not common, ordinary, utilitarian stuff that you cook with. These are real things. So in the exhibit where Native Americans, Africans, and Andeans are also present, we'll have to save that for another day. It's just not gonna fit right now. Many more subjects to dive into that will be part of our programs. The ball game, and I hope you don't miss the ball game area. The ball game was very important for obvious reasons. We're across the street from the ball, right? The ball game. So it just was a natural to concentrate on the ball game. Uh, the Popol Vuh, which is the Mayan Book of the Dead. Pirates, love pirates. We have a whole section on pirates. Cartography, the maps. So the collection is really a treasure trove. So we're gonna start with the Tainos, and the Taino work is in the case, you see the way this is arranged? In the first four cases are the treasures, and that's a selection of the most um, important, I should say, treasures of the exhibit that we chose for their significance and their representations of the various cultures that are here, and also because they're extraordinary examples 
of the skill sets of the various peoples that made them, especially some of the Maya objects. So when you go into the exhibit, you should really walk in front of these four cases and see what's in them. And then you can start at the left and chronologically, starting with Christopher Columbus, go right through it and into the back where we've got maps, interactive maps, the ball game, the pirates, and the buccaneers. So that's the story that the exhibit tells. So among the first Indians that were, that were encountered by Columbus uh, were the Tainos, the most advanced group of the West Indies, probably pushed by cannibalistic Carib Indians from the Lesser Antilles. They spoke a derived Arawak language and that came from the earlier peoples that had migrated into this area from South America and taken over by the Tainos. In other words, the Tainos became the dominant tribal group. They were agriculturalists. Their artifacts are of, we call this art. This is not art. None of it is art. These were the artifacts of ritual. They all had a very specific purpose. We don't know a lot about the purpose. We know that they're beautiful and they're fascinating, and that's why we like to look at them. Um, the leader was called a cacique. So they had a very elaborate pantheon of gods and goddesses, and the artifacts in this collection have to do with that, have to do with who the gods and the goddesses were and some of the rituals. So this little piece right here is um, uh, the god Atabe, very important god. And it looks like he's got a little baby. She has a little baby. They, it has a little baby. Um, it has certain markings that represent perhaps beads or ornaments that were once on its head. And the face is set like a heart, like the owl shape. The owl is very important in the Caribbean. And those of you who have visited places like Jamaica, Costa Rica, know that you go into caves, Cuba, you go into caves and owls, lots of owls. So, and in fact, what's the symbol of Bacardi? All right, an owl. Highly style, stylized sculpture of this mother and child is also in the case and may have been found in a cave and made of cave accretions. In other words, the stuff that builds up in the cave, a lot of it is the droppings of the owls. And then they, it hardens, gets sort of fossilized, and they would take these blocks of it and carve it out. So the cave is really important in all of the ancient cultures. I mean, in Western world as well, the caves of the Greeks where some of the oracles are located. So this is not unusual for the Taino and for many peoples in the world. The cave's access to the underworld made it a perfect location for life and death rituals. So her face is defined by that heart-shaped expectant face of the owl as well. An owl is a nocturnal creature associated with caves, the ability to fly into the spirit realm. That's why the owl is important. It becomes a helper to the priest who needs to reach that spirit world and often uses an alter ego, a bird, an animal to assist in that. This little piece may have been a protective amulet to represent the transformative powers of all peoples. Not only the priests and the shamans, but we are all transformative, right? We come and we go from one world into a next. Here's a vessel in the form of a bat. And so bats and owls, I'm getting owls and bats confused, sorry. I meant to say bat before. Um, the Bacardi is a bat. Uh, the Taino believed living creatures had a dual existence. It can transform into either people or animals. They also believed that the souls of the dead took the form of animals and moved freely among the living in the dark of the night. Nocturnal creatures like bats are common in Taino art and are associated with death. So this offering vessel is protected by the wings of the bat while paying homage to the creature's power in life and death. It may have been used in a cahoba ceremony 
that sought communication with the dead through the transformative powers of the bat under the guide of the shaman, the priest, who leads these ceremonies. The bat lives in caves, so he has this access, or it has access to the world of the dead. And as I said, very important for communication. Taino rituals were, as, there's a whole pantheon of gods and goddesses. They had su a supreme god, a fertility god, a goddess of the waters, it's the images that represent these gods and the rituals are called zemis. The most powerful are perceived as supernatural beings. You had to be nice to the zemi and the zemi would be nice to you. The zemi didn't like you. The zemi could invoke the powers that of, of, of evil upon you as well. The zemis are some of the most important of the Taino objects. They represent political, social power, fertility, ancestor worship, the afterlife. Many of these offerings are buried with the dead. So all of this is led by a shaman or a priest who was the important healer and the messenger. The Cahoba ritual was really important for the Taino. And this idea of hallucinogenic rituals is something that is really worldwide. Um, cahoba is the, the substance that is used in the Caribbean. It puts the shaman or the cacique, the leader, the priest, into a trance. And from that trance, he could message the spirit world. And the messages could translate back and forth. Before they begin this ritual, the body has to be purged of anything that interferes with the spirits. So this is an example, and there's another one in the case. I've thrown in some other examples, not just from this collection, to kind of enhance the discussion. Um, but the, this is a vomit stick, or it's a spatula. Um, the, as a vomit stick, it would be used just for that. You stick it down your throat, you vomit. And that purges your body. As a spatula, it could be used to sort of scoop the cahoba into the, uh, the ritual vessel for the creation of the hallucinogenic. This particular one is decorated with ancestor figures or spirit gods. They help the shaman travel among the universe. A very beautiful little object. I'm showing you this, which is not ours, don't we wish? I mean, everybody wants this. This is one of the most extraordinary Taino objects. It's actually in a museum in Rome, but I never can resist showing it because, again, this is all about the beauty of these things that these people create and the sophistication of how they work. So this is a zemi uh, from the 16th century, a masterpiece for sure, created from various objects, some native to the Caribbean, some showing external cultural influences. And by the 16th century, there were external influences, right? The explorers had, had arrived there. The face is from a rhinoceros horn, which was brought to, brought to the Caribbean from Africa. The beads and the glass adorning the deity are of European origin. They were brought as trade goods by the explorers. So it's a prime example of the blending of cultures and the influence the Spanish had on native religion and practices, and also the speed at which it happened. So the Spanish arrived. They impose Christianity and their European system upon the natives. But the natives throughout the Americas are incredibly tenacious. They are not just going to say, oh, OK, we're Catholics. Not that easy. They maintained so much of what they believed under the guise of Christianity. Yes, they would pretend it was so-and-so, such and such a saint, but actually it wasn't. And this happened, this sort of syncretism happened throughout the Americas and is a very important part of, of um, the studies of what happens in South America. This is a Zemi. Um, this is our Zemi who's sitting over there. And Zemis are often described as three pointers for obvious reasons. 
the use of these objects is really not clear. There are some theories that say that it's a god and it would be placed in significant locations as a god, as an offering, or to speak to the gods. It may have also been placed um, in agricultural areas, like in the corners of fields, for fertility rites. But they're, they're really very interesting, and they're, they're carved with, with faces that vary from animal to kind of composites, fantasy, uh, as well. Here are a couple of other examples of zemis, who they are, what they are. It's the mystery of this culture. Also from um, Antigua in the Antilles is a god, Obial, Guabaran, who's the dog god. He's the keeper of the souls of the immediately departed. It's made of shell. Originally, it was coated with pigment, but it's beautifully carved. So you're going to see a lot of different materials in this exhibit that the people used and uh, were so skillful, technically, at carving, whether it be bone. This little piece, this little figure is um, uh, made of bone, of bone or shell or wood, stone, and of course, all the pottery that we'll get to. So this is just a, a little amulet. So the Maya. The Maya, some of the, the most significant objects in the Kislak collection are Maya. He was a great collector of Maya uh, ceramics, especially what we describe as Maya polychrome, which means many colors. So you see them here in the front, right, right there under where it says Kislak Center. There's a beautiful piece. Um, so the Maya, their accomplishments often rival those of Europe at the same time. They were scientists, they were astronomers, renowned mathematicians. They had a highly advanced numerical system. They were architects. There's a pyramid there. They built roads and causeways and bridges and aqueducts. They had the only complex writing system in America. And guess what? They're still around. Talk about tenacity. We have many Maya descendants and Maya people in Miami. So this idea that everything was destroyed and wiped out, mm -mm. they're very tenacious peoples. This is uh, some information about the Maya calendar, very complicated, but just to show you how complicated it was and how uh, they were great astronomers, where do you get the calendar from? You get the calendar from looking at the sky. So they understood the sky, they understood the movement of the stars, the planets, and created a calendar, a 260-day calendar, um, that is basically our calendar. You know, they, they knew exactly how to create the, there you can see the solar year, the weeks, the month, the 52-year calendar round of the Maya. They were people of great intelligence. They had writing through a system of glyphs. As I said, they were astronomy mathematicians. They had a tenacity for sorrow. They're not barbarians, not barbarians. And so often the story told is that the Spanish had to come here because they had to convert the barbarians. They had to um, civilize them. Well, these are pretty civilized people. They really were civilized people. They were not barbarians at all. The Maya portrayed the cosmos and the other world in various ways. Serpents and alligators became the tangible entities that could inhabit the other world and encircle the earth or the heavens. We call these constellations. Right? Look at the sky and you see these things. Same thing, they were looking at the sky. Um, on the left is a bowl with swirl patterns of the sky serpent, and there is a bowl in there that has the Milky Way on it. So not only did they see it, but they knew how to record it. Um, the, this great cosmic serpent is seen as the Milky Way, and serpents are important throughout pre-Columbian cultures. In fact, they have multiple meanings. In fact, 
it's very basic to a lot of our culture too. Remember Adam and Eve? The serpent. So here's just some examples of the writing, the symbols, the glyphs, and the pictographs that are part of the record in, uh, throughout the Americas. Uh, the Maya glyphs have been translated. We can read them, whereas other symbol, symbols and glyphs have not been translated um, or sort of simplistically translated, but not as complexly, uh, completely as the Mayas have. So there's your Aztec uh, calendar stone with Aztec symbols around it, Maya glyphs, Zapotec, that's Monte Alban in Mexico, Chimu, and on the upper right is an Inca tunic, also full of symbols that have not been completely translated. But they're languages. They're not our language, but they were languages. The Maya glyphs, just some examples of them. Um, they're really very interesting to look at, whether you understand what they are or not. The glyphs describe events. They tell stories. We have a panel in the exhibit over here that uh, we're a section about writing and symbols that you can see. So the symbols tell a story. It helps to make my point about the intelligence of the people. They had books, almost all burned because they were heathen. They were pagan. So the Spanish priests burned them. Today, less than 12 of these codices remain. Four are Mayan, a few Aztec and Mixtec. So the facsimiles that were created early on when enlightened priests arrived in the Americas and realized the destruction that was taking place, they um, commissioned the native people, the scribes, to create other books and facsimiles as well. So facsimiles are really very important, and, and we've got some facsimiles in this collection as well. The idea of telling a story, even the, the Mexican coat of arms, that's the story. It's the story of the Aztecs as they were searching for a place to locate and to build their civilization were told by their god, Huitzilopochtli, to find an eagle perched on a cactus on a rock. Where was that? In the streets of Mexico. So that's where they landed. And all around them, you see little figures and symbols that tell about their journey and who they were. So another thing that's really interesting about this exhibit is the people, it tells the story of the people and the priests. I said the priests are really important because the, uh, the objects will tell us about the priests. I said these are ritual objects, so the priests are really important. Sometimes the cacique or the leader, in the case of the Inca, it's the Inti, they, they are the, they're also gods and leaders as well. So we have a number of objects, some right in front of you in this first case, that give us images of the people, what they look like, the kings, the queens, the priests, the scribes, the ball players, the dwarfs, the men and women of all descriptions are found in the artifacts. So you have to ask, why? Why did they make these figural objects? They made them to bury with the dead. It may have been that the person in the grave may have been a king and who had dwarfs as his subjects and buried a dwarf with him, a picture of a dwarf with him, and in some cases buried the dwarf too, um, so that in the afterworld he would still have that same attendant figure. Dwarfs were very important, especially hunchback dwarfs. It was believed that the, the back, the, the hump on their back, was a repository of of spirits, so they were they were really um, very, very highly regarded. On the right is a tripod vase that that shows you another technique 
whereas the one on the left is a, a burnished um, ceramic. The one on the right is done by a different technique that's like a fresco, just like you make fresco on the walls where you would have a layer of plaster and then draw and paint upon the plaster and then fire it. The same technique was used to make uh, a vessel like that. Also, it's kind of hard to see, but you see how there's a little bit of blue? And if you look in the case, especially right here and right there, you'll see blue. That's why it's really important for me to be quiet and let you walk through this. I'm gonna stop this so you have time to do this so you can see these things in person. But Maya blue, a very precious blue pigment that has stood the test of time. Its exact composition is kind of a mystery, but you know it is a composite of organic and inorganic constituents, primarily indigo dyes derived from the leaves of anil, the indigo plant, and they combined it with other natural clays, which um, is not known to have existed in, bun in abundancy in, the, in Mesoamerica. So that means that it was a precious substance. It wasn't something readily available. Maya blue has not faded over time. The color has resisted chemical solvents and acids, such as nitric acid. Its resistance against chemi chemical aggression is paramount. It's also a way of telling fakes. If you have an object, somebody wants to sell you an object with Maya blue on it, put some nail polish remover on it. If it comes off, it's not Maya blue. Um, so it's associated with the center of a flame. Think of a flame, the blue in the center of a flame, holding the most heat and therefore considered the most precious part of the flame. It's found on ceramics, on, in some codices, the written books, and on body painting, especially for sacrificial victims. There is blue. So it's a very precious substance. We have in this exhibit three extraordinary examples of ceramics with Maya blue. The one on the left is the diving god, and he's my favorite. He's little. He's right over there. He's only, he's only about five inches high. And in the middle is a throne box, and he is over here. And on the right is a palace, a Maya vessel with a palace scene on it. So as I said, the kings and the priests required offering goods. The little box that's over there, incredibly rare and precious example of Maya ceramics and Maya blue. Um, it was meant to hold ritual objects and offerings. It's full of symbolism. It's, a, it's an object that can be read. Every inch of it can be read. It has serpents. It has a jaguar pelt. It has the bearded lord um, seated in the center. He's dressed in the costume of a Copan. Copan is a very important Maya city. He's wearing a turban made of a long woven ribbon, layer upon layer, assuming the shape of a large stepped disc that pushes this whole headdress, very complicated headdress upward. He wears a badge of office made of twisted serpents surrounding a supernatural face. And the details of Maya blue tell us this is a very important person that owned this offering box. In addition to the ceramics and the precious materials like Maya blue of the ceramics, I have to talk about gold, right? Because we know that the conquest was not this idealistic, just let's convert the pagans. The conquest was about gold. And gold was a very important part of the architect archaeological record. And once the Spaniards realized there was gold, they wanted the source of the gold. And they looked in many places, and in many places they did not find it, but in many places they did find it. Usually when they did find it, it was already made into something. So what did they do? They melted it down. And they made gold bricks out of it and sent it back to Spain to um, finance their wars. This is a little pen pendant from Panama, from a culture called Cocle. And it's cast by lost wax casting. 
which is a technique that is used today, but it's a very ancient technique. The Africans were using it hundreds of years before um, even the people of uh, the Americas were using it. But it's a complex design, and it's interesting because it's a fantasy design. And the fantasy of putting creatures together and um, making them as ritual objects is the mystery. What does it mean? Who wore it? When did they wear it? Um, what is the significance of, again, the, the snake heads and the god heads that are part of this, and the tusks that face it as well? And it's the little, little object right in front of me in that treasure case. More Kokle designs, the gold, the idea of gold for rituals worn by the elite in life and death. The serpentine designs on a piece of Panamanian pottery on the left is also found in um, a pendant in gold. And on the right, you can see an example of a burial where the uh, very important person, whoever he was, um, is buried with gold. The people, who were they? What do they look like? Throughout this, you could do a really interesting project just talking about the people and who they were, what they looked like, what you see, what is revealed through the evidence of these objects that are throughout the exhibit. In, on this slide, we've got this beautiful jade mask, which is right there in the case. We've got a Mochica piece, Mochica's Peru. Um, another piece from Peru, from West Mexico, Maya. It's, it's a wonderful selection that tells us a lot about who the people were and what they looked at. The early figuring traditions really come from West Mexico. They were the, that was the earliest area to make figurative pottery. Um, and the, they really, again, give us an example of who the people were, what they looked like, how they dressed, of body painting, scarification, and of course, what is more precious than the little dog? The little dog, the very famous Mexican dogs, um, the dogs were buried with the dead. Why are dogs important? Dogs would lead into the spirit world. They followed the path. You followed them because they knew the path. So here's the diving god, um, an ochre paid bodied god painted with red and white markings and Maya blue details. He seems to be diving from a spirit world to the earthly. He wears a white face bird headdress, probably rep representing a Yucatec and owl. In each hand he is holding a copal incense cake and that would be burned in the ceremonies before the temples in the um, death cult rituals as well. Who is he? Many theories about him. Some have said he's a bee. Is the bee important? Yeah. Pollinator or a wasp? Is he a hero returning? Is it Venus, an avatar of Quetzalcoatl, who was Kukul Khan for the Maya, the morning star? It represents the descending Venus connected with the worship of Kukul Khan. Maybe, but we don't know for sure. That's why these things are really fun, too, because you can kind of tell your, your own story. The ball game. A very important part of the exhibit. It's played in various areas with regional rules. Uh, there are many special objects in this exhibit. There's also a video reenactment so that you can see how the ball game was played in that particular area of Mexico. But the ball game was played in the Caribbean, Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, uh, Yucatan, and in parts of Mexico as well. On the left is a vessel, um, a Maya vessel. That's a polychrome, many colors. And it shows a ball player with this very complex um, costume that he's wearing that protects him going through the game that belt-like uh, thing that he's wearing was probably made of like a canvas material in reality when they played the game. But in ceremonies to commemorate these objects and the ball players who were very important, um, they actually have made stone yokes 
like this, and we've got it in the exhibit, um, that are commemorating the ritual that is associated with the ball game. Because remember, it's, this is a ritual. It's all a ritual. So all of these artifacts you see were made long before Columbus was even born. Many of the items were for burials, to use in the voyage to the afterlife. Most of them were made and used by people living in a stone age. The ancient Maya never used the wheel. The ancient Americans never used the wheel. Even though some of their toys have wheels, it's really funny to think of that. There are toys buried in the graves in West Mexico that have wheels, but they didn't use the wheel. Jade was the hardest and the most precious substance to the ancient Mayas, not gold, which is why they really, you know, the South Americans couldn't really understand why the Spanish were so keen on getting all the gold, because to them, gold represented the sun. Yes, it was important, but it was jade that was the most important. The Maya people never died out. They still live today. There are 20 different dialects of the Maya language in use, but they're so different from one another, they can't communicate with each other in many areas of uh, uh, the Caribbean. Ear spools were worn only by the elite, not only for the Maya, but for the Inca and the Aztecs. In fact, the Spanish called the Inca orejones because of their big ear spools. Um, the, the textiles preserved today came from mummy bum bundles in hot, dry areas. And I know all of you have asked about the feathers, real treasures of this exhibit. We've got two beautiful feather um, textiles, in this case and one over there, that are um, from Peru. And they're perfect because they were buried in the desert where it never rained. So those tombs are very protected, and that's why the colors are so vivid. But, you know, we can do a whole story about textiles and feathers another time, deep dive into that. So in defense of the Indians, the first edition of Bartolome de las Casas' third tract advocating the better treatment of the Amer Am Amerindians by the Spanish and revealing abuses is a very important story. The priest was a 16th century Spanish colonist, historian, and reformer before becoming a Dominican friar and the first officially appointed protector of the Indians. And his little book is in the case. So like Bartolome de las Casas, my story is a defense of a remarkable people. Thank you. Thank you.